Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And I want to welcome uh, Vincent as our latest Patreon supporter at patreon.greatdetectives.net. He's coming on board at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. And uh, you can uh, support us there as well. If you'd like to send a one-time donation, you can uh, go to uh, support.greatdetectives.net, send a donation through the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net, or also mail in a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. Also, you can still get our Joe Friday Never Said Just the Facts, Ma'am t-shirt available at uh, friday.greatdetectives.net. Well, we're back to our listener's choice countdown. You voted in a poll, and uh, we are counting down your top 20 choices in the short division. And uh, today we're going to uh, give you our number 13 series in the standard division, Pat Novak for Hire. And actually, this was one of the first series that we did. Uh, and uh, if I had gone with my original conception of the great detectives of old time radio, where we played an entire series, you know, every day, Monday through Friday, uh, this would have been the first uh, program we did. Uh, thankfully, we went another direction. So we played this one over 18 weeks in our first season. And uh, then we actually replayed the series as we were getting ready to start doing Dragnet uh, several years later. So I've gone ahead and I've chosen an episode from Pat Novak for Hire. This is from the 1949 ABC Network run. The original air date, April the 2nd, 1949. And this one is Father Leahy. Pat Novak. Or higher. Sure, I'm Pat Novak. For higher. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to say it. Oh, you can dress it up and tell how many shopping days there are till Christmas. But if you got yourself in the market, you can't waste time talking. You gotta be as brief as a pauper's will. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, everybody wants a piece of the cake. And the only easy buck is the one you just spent. Oh, it's a good life. If you work real hard and study a little on the side, you got to trade by the time you get to prison. I rent boats and do a few other odd jobs you can't afford to pick it on. It works out all right if you put your tongue in hock. Because down here, you shouldn't talk. It's like installing a set of drums in a belfry. You make some noise, but it's never the right kind. I found that out a few days ago. Must have been Tuesday or Wednesday night, anyway. I was sitting in the office reading Time magazine when the door opened. I looked up and had to keep right on going, because the guy was so tall he'd have to bend over to see through a transom. And he had a voice deep enough to read out as a bassoon. Good evening, Mr. Novak. I'll take your word for it. You have a small office. I'm small time. What's on your mind? My name is Leahy. I want to hire you. Yeah, sit down. Are you cold? Yeah. That overcoat around your neck, you're either cold or a priest. Oh. I'm a priest, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry, Father. You got a slow brogue. What do you need? A few hours of your time. I want you to help a man escape from prison. 
Uh-huh. Father, you'll never get along with the bishop. Mr. Novak, in a curious way, this is an errand of mercy. Well, this isn't my year for mercy. I'm sorry, Father. Maybe you don't like to hear it that way, but if I got the right fee, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. When I say it's an errand of mercy, that's what it is. Sometime tonight, a man is going to break out of Alcatraz. If he's allowed to get into town, he may kill somebody. You want me to stop him? That's right. And if he doesn't kill anybody, he can still be shot down by the police. Well, that's the percentage, Father. If he comes off that rock, he knows that. Stop worrying about him. If you could bring him to me, I know I can talk him into going back. Tell headquarters they'll do the same thing. If I did that, I'd break a promise. This is the only thing I can do. Will you help me? Yeah, I suppose. How do I pick him up? Treadwater in the bail he comes by? He's due in at Pier 19 sometime tonight. When he comes ashore, bring him to me. I'll be waiting at the ferry building. Well, suppose he doesn't want to come. Suppose he wants to party. How am I going to get him there? I don't ask you how to say the beads. If you're any good, you'll get him there. But you don't want him in sections. I want him all at once, Mr. Novak. I wouldn't ask you this if it weren't important. But i got to help him. He's one of my boys. Yeah, sure. What's his name? Joe Feldman. Feldman? Yeah. If I don't worry about the spelling, you don't have to either. He's one of my boys. Slow down. Nobody's pushing your father. I don't know when he's due, but I'll be at the ferry building from 8 o'clock on. Yeah. I only got one worry. Huh? Is there really a guy named Father Leahy? I suppose you'll have to take a chance on that. Yeah, well, it's a big chance. You come in here with a story anybody can see through like a screen door and I'm supposed to buy it. You could dig up a collar. What happens if you're a fake? Just try to guess right. Suppose I don't. Then you're in the same spot Pontius Pilate was. Good night, Mr. Novak. Whoever Joe Feldman was, he had a good friend. Because when Father Leahy walked out of there, I knew he was all right. You could tell without even testing him. The way when you pick up a pool cue, you know right away whether it's any good or not. He stood at the door for a minute, and then he walked out. And you got a funny feeling that he didn't walk into the night that he was big enough to wrap it around his shoulders and take it with him. I got a last look at him as he turned the corner under a street lamp. He looked even taller now, and you knew if somebody stood him in an oil field, you couldn't tell him from the rest of the derricks. Well, I made a couple of phone calls, and then I closed shop and went down to the end of Pier 19 to wait. The bay looked as dark as a bruised crow. The fog was beginning to drift in over near the piers. By 9 o'clock, you couldn't see a thing. You felt like a guy trying to shave in a bathroom full of steam. I was about... Thirty feet from the end of the pier when a small boat pulled in and let somebody out. I was sure it was my boy, so I moved behind a shed and waited. The boat pulled away and the guy started down the dock. I waited until he moved past me. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. You ought to be glad. How's the rock? Huh? You lonely, mister? What do you care? If you are, buy a beer and talk to the bartender. I'm busy. All right, you're tough, Feldman. Let's go now. You got dates for us? You're going to see Father Leahy. Come on. Well, you doubling for Gabriel? Leave me alone, mister. I don't want to go. Now, look, Junior, if we draw straws, you're going to get the short one. Oh. Is that supposed to be a gun in your pocket? Well, you get a chance to find out. That's what I'm going to do, because I have one, too. If it starts to hurt your stomach, back down. <laughs> now, where's yours, Mr. Timid? <laughs> it's a bad night for bluffing, so goodbye. Yeah, come here. <laughs> go easy, fella. It's a big one. Well, you can let go easy, then. Come on, drop it. Drop it in the water. Let go. <laughs> now, you want to start again? No. All right, I'll see you, man, Leahy. I gotta make a stop first. Make it after. It'll take five minutes. Look, mister, if you want to do it the easy way, let me make the stop. You go with me. All right, five minutes, and then you see Father Leahy. Suit yourself. I doubt if I'll make heaven, but if you want to run interference, it's all right with me. If you need the credits, you need the credits. <laughs> Joe Feldman wasn't very friendly. He sat over in the corner of the cab and he didn't say a thing. He just kept looking at me and waiting, like a guy feeding arsenic to a rich aunt. A few minutes later, the cab pulled up in front of a hotel on Geary Street and we walked in. One look at that lobby and you got the idea. The place was about as cozy as an abandoned mine shaft. Over by the wall, there was an old mohair couch and the legs on it were so warped pretty soon it was going to look like period furniture. There were a few chairs, and over by the stairs, a faded calendar of a girl in tights holding a jar of mayonnaise and winking, whatever that meant. And there was a broken clock over the desk. But you knew it was all right, 
Because nobody there cared about keeping track of time. It was something you got rid of in a hurry, like a bent quarter. We went up to the second floor. We walked down a long hall that smelled like an ante room to a sewer. When Feldman knocked on the door, she opened it right away. The room was full of taboo. She stood leaning there for a minute, a sort of a girl who moves when she stands still. She had blonde hair. She was kind of pretty, except she could see somebody had used her badly, like a dictionary in a stupid family. Feldman seemed to know her. Hello, Ann. Well, the harvest hands arrive all at once. Yeah. Good for the crops, but tough on a woman. Come in. Who's your friend? A missionary, I guess. He grabbed me down by the docks. Does he talk or just stand there looking healthy? He growls a little. Do you really growl? Come on, hurry up, lady. Your friend's got a date. I'll bet you bite instead. <laughs> Don't worry about him. He can go over in a corner and play fifth wheel. Now, look, he's got five minutes. Use him quick. Yes? I uh, came up with a message, Ann. The time's been changed. Stay around till 10 o'clock. All right. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. You want the other four minutes? Let's go. All right. Open the door. Yeah. You didn't open it fast enough. When Feldman hit me, I wobbled for a minute and went down like the price of winter wheat. If Father Leahy had any loose prayers lying around, now was the time to crate them up and ship them over, because I wasn't going to stay awake long enough to test the varnish. I rolled on the floor a couple of times, and then I took a rain check on the next couple of hours. When I woke up, it was like buying a new Nash and then finding out you can't drive. Joe Feldman was lying next to me with his throat cut like a pound of rib roast. His head was over to one side, and his body was twisted over the other way as if he couldn't make up his mind which direction to die in. I got up and rolled him on his back. He was grinning like a Pullman porter at the end of the line, and his mouth was half open as if he expected you to drop in a suggestion on your way by. I noticed right then how thin and small he was, about as fat as a shadow and tall enough to scrape his head on a lampshade. Well, there wasn't anything I could do but wish him luck. So I called the check stand at the ferry building and had them page Father Leahy. About two minutes later, he answered. Hello, Father Leahy? This is Novak, Father. Yes, Call in the outfield. Your boy's dead. I see. What happened? Somebody didn't like him lots. I wasn't around for the main event. Where are you, on the pier? No, I'm in some cave up on Geary Street. He wanted to come by here first. Father, who's Ann? I don't know. Has Feldman got a girlfriend? He's got two sisters, I think. One of them's named Ann. A tall blonde with lots of speed? That's your definition, but it'll probably do. Uh, she was around for a while, in case you ever want to check. Get on the back stairs and pretend I never heard of Joe Feldman. I'm sorry, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it worked out that way. So am I, Father. If you liked him, I'm sorry. He may have been a nice little guy. Huh? Well, I could do without him, but if you like it, I'll say he was a good little guy. How little? I don't know. We could start a picket fence with him. Why? Because you've got the wrong man, Mr. Novak. Huh? If he's under six feet, you've got the wrong man. Whoever you've got up there isn't Joe Feldman. Well, he's happy about it now, Father. Whoever he is, I'm sorry. It's the percentage. Why the percentage? If it isn't Joe Feldman, why? That's the waterfront, Father. If your name's Joe Nobody, you still can't do better than eight to five. At least Joe Feldman was smart. If you're going to get your throat cut, it's a good time to send in a substitute. As soon as Father Leahy hung up, I knew hanging around that hotel was going to be a waste of time, like sending mash notes to a bearded lady. If I couldn't prove the guy was alive, they were going to charge extra down at the desk. And if Hellman down at Homicide ever found out I brought the guy up here, I'd have about as much chance as a bottle of scotch at a cocktail party. So I picked up my hat and started for the door. I looked at him once more, but he wasn't going to say goodbye, so I started out. Boo. Oh. Hello, Hellman. Expecting me, Novak? No, I'd have rolled him first. Yeah. Invite me in. Crash the party, Hellman. You'll be more at home. All right. He sure looks lazy. Who is he? He's supposed to be Joe Feldman. But Feldman let him do the hard work. They must be good friends. You better check. I don't know the guy. Yeah, help me roll him over. Okay. There. 
Here, here's his wallet. Hey, let me have it. You're going to break your fingernails. Give it here. All right. Yeah. No money in here. You're going to drop the case? Here's his card, Mike Greeley. Oh. Didn't he like you either? You're wearing out the rug, Hellman. I don't know the guy. You brought him up? I checked at the desk. Well, check on who left then. I brought him up here on a phony lead. Why? Because I was hired to tow him around. He liked the room, so we dropped by. And he cut himself shaven? I wasn't around. There was a girl here for the handshakes. Oh. What kind of girl? I don't know, Hellman. How many kinds are there? Her name was Ann. She had a fast pulse. That's all I know. You must know more than that. If you don't, you'll never get a lawyer. I won't need one. You'll save money at least, because you've got a real hole this time, Novak. We get a phone tip and find you in the murder room. You got half a story, Hellman. I know, but I'll get the other half. Until then, you're under technical arrest. It's practically the real thing. Now, you got a technical head, Hellman. I wouldn't tip myself off. Somebody else would. Walk around, Novak, and tire yourself out. Because you'll wind up sitting down. In the meantime, I'll have you tailed. Your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. Now, look, Hellman, I'm going to double back. This guy's a phony lead. I was supposed to meet a guy named Joe Feldman, but he never showed up. He didn't? No. I got a dead copper to prove he did. Your boy, Joe Feldman, killed a sergeant named Grubb at the Gold Rush Club, Club a half hour ago. You better start that walk, Novak. two kind of raps you can't ever beat. Cheating a woman with kids and killing a copper. So I knew Joe Feldman could put in for reservations right away. And I knew Hellman would stay with him like a February cold. He'd stay with the whole thing and I'd have a real tough time explaining. <laughs> I couldn't explain it to myself. What about the message up in that room? Why did the little guy tell Ann to stay until 10 o'clock? Why did he get off at Pier 19 instead of Joe Feldman? Once he got there, what was Feldman doing at the Gold Rush Club, and why did they spot him so fast? Well, it pointed to one thing, a police tip-off, but that's as far as I could go. On the way down, I stopped at the desk, and I asked the clerk to see the register. He pushed it over toward me. It was a dirty brown thing that looked like an old tortilla somebody had left behind. It didn't do any good. The registration was a phony. Well, I had to do something in a hurry, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, and he used to be a smart one, too. And still he started chasing a jigger of beer with a glass of whiskey. I finally found him in the Pied Piper room, arguing with somebody about the words to Annie Laurie. Ah, Patsy, a drink for Mr. Novak. Something cheap but impressive. Oh, stop it, will you, Jocko? Are you going to be drunk all your life? Yes, it's only a matter of willpower, Patsy. I'm probably the only man in the world who intends to carry a hangover into eternity. Well, stop long enough to give me a hand, will you? I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you can't recognize it, Patsy. You're fuzzy, Jocko. You have the social outlook of a bull with a hot foot and there's no hope for you because if from time to time a moral feeling does sweep over you, you mistake it for influenza and go to bed. All right, all right. Oh, you try hard enough. You go through the motions, Patsy, but you never get anywhere. You go stumbling through life doing a tight wire act on a rubber band. You're always in the middle. Will you listen to me? It's because there's no variety in your life. You won't allow it. You're a broken-down banjo, not a very good instrument to begin with. And to make matters worse, you allow everybody to come along and pluck the same string. All right. Are you all through now, Jocko? Yes. You sound angry. I think you have a bad disposition, too. What kind of trouble? Well, I tried to help some guy out of prison tonight. You got drunk and thought you were the parole board? No, I did it for a good guy, a priest named Leahy. Yes? The guy was already out, and Father Leahy was trying to hurt him back without getting shot. But this guy, Feldman, didn't want to play. Another drink will clear this up for me? I picked up the wrong guy. I took him to a Geary Street hotel. I napped a while and I cut him up like a piece of parsley. Sounds like a gruesome hotel. The dead guy's name is Mike Greeley. I don't even know who he is. Well, this is no time to start building a friendship anyway. Uh, who is in the room? Some girl. She may be Feldman's sister. Would she kill a man? Well, if she did, he'd be crushed to death. No, I'm sure somebody else came in that room. You better talk to Feldman. Well, he's a hard man to reach. A sergeant almost made it tonight. Feldman shot his way out of the Gold Rush Club. Hmm, that's one way to get out of a nightclub. Well, Hellman steamed up, so you got to help me, Jocko. You'd better look up Father Leahy. You'll probably be electrocuted, and if you are, he may have some drag. I want you to go down to the Chronicle Morgue and pull the clips on Joe Feldman, will you? Get everything you can, and then hit the horse parlors. Find out what they know about him, huh? Maybe he's a heavy drinker. I'll check the bar. Jocko, wake up and get down there. If I don't pace Hellman on this thing, I'll be a dead pigeon. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You might start cooing. 
Good night, lover. Well, as soon as I left Jocko, I went down to the Gold Rush Club on O'Farrell Street. It was a little nightclub where they charge 80 cents for a drink of whiskey that'd kill a redwood. The floor show was just as bad, and the headliner was an oriental dancer whose only talent was a zipper. I sat at the bar, and I tried to pry some talk loose, but they liked the boss. I finally got a hold of a fat waitress who should have been wearing a harness instead of slacks. She told me a little. The owner was a guy named Charlie Giffen, and he used to make book with Joe Feldman. She told me that Joe's sister worked at the Gold Rush Club for a while, but she got sick a few months ago and quit. I asked the girl if tonight's shooting was a police plant. She didn't know, but she said that Feldman had been in to see Giffen tonight, and on his way out, he ran into trouble. I gave her five bucks, and she looked hurt as if somebody had given her a plow for Christmas. She showed me where Giffen's office was, and I walked back there. Giffen wasn't there, but the taboo was. Do you have the right door, Mr. Novak? You seem to be in all of them. Do you mind if I lean in the doorway? No, but I'll bet you need shoulder pads by this time. Where's Charlie Giffen? Why? I want to ask him about Joe Feldman. Ask me. I'm his sister. I'll ask you about Mike Greeley. Who killed him? I don't know. Is he dead? Yeah, he couldn't stand the bleeding. He was all right when I left. What were you doing up there? Waiting for Joe. My sister and I were going to meet him up there. Relax, Mr. Novak. Relax for me. No, when people relax for you, they do it on the floor. I was out long enough for homicide to catch up. They want me for Mike Greeley, but I'm going to send him you or Joe. You're forgetting my sister Norma. Should I? For most things, yes. But she was up in that room tonight after me. I'll ask her. Ask her about the money, too. Well, you're out in front of me on that. You can see me better that way. Joe had a lot of money on him tonight. With the police out, he wouldn't carry it with him. By now, the money's gone, so's Norma. Uh. Do you know where it is? No. Well... You growl, and you bite, and you lie. You must have a full day. Sit down, relax. I want to see Giffen. He won't be back tonight. Now lean back. That's it, Patsy. You really want that money? I can split a motive. Can you split it 90-10? If you can't, you better get your breath back. I won't need it. I don't want to talk anymore. Come here and let me stop. Over close. If I get any closer, I'll be on the other side of you. Yes. Hmm. Patsy, you ought to get time and a half, darling. Hello, Anne. Thought you were coming in to curl up with a good book. Uh, Mr. Novak came by full of questions. This is Charlie Giffen, Patsy. I got some questions for you, too, Giffen. Well, ask him down the bore of this gun. Over by the desk, Novak. Did you lose that knife, Giffen? By the desk. That's it. Where's the money, Novak? I gave her the last report. Where's the money? Joe gave it to somebody. Try the Red Cross, mister. You got a tender face, Novak. Now get out of this club before I slap on a cover charge. Oh, I was getting sick of tonight. In three hours, I'd seen more service than a mix master in a cooking school. When I left the Gold Rush Club, I dropped by headquarters. Hellman had nothing to show but his badge. They had a dragnet around the city for Joe Feldman, and they'd lined up the record on the dead guy in the hotel. He'd been a friend of Joe's before his trip to Alcatraz. There wasn't much I could do. If homicide couldn't find Joe, I couldn't find him. So I looked up Norma Feldman in the phone book. She had an apartment out on the avenues, but when I called, there was no answer, so I tagged by my apartment to see if Jocko had left a message. When I opened the door, Norma was there, and she had a gun to keep her company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. I came up here to kill you. Well, if you're Norma, the rest of the family's ahead of you. What's happened to my brother? I don't know. Please, what's happened to him, Mr. Novak? Well, if he killed a cop, he's hiding out. I know he didn't mean to do that, Mr. Novak. Joe's not that way. Somebody told the police he was going to be there. That's why I came up here to see you. Oh, put down the gun, huh? You can't shoot through the tears. <laughs> Mr. Novak, if you know where he is, tell me. Make him give himself up. Make him stop hiding like a small, frightened animal. He looked big to that copper. Please. Please find him. You got him. Yeah. Hello, this is Jocko. Yeah. You sound ruffled. Joe Feldman's sister just walked in to kill me. Don't argue. It's the best offer you've had. What'd you find out? Feldman has two sisters. I know. They both go to pieces. The Gold Rush Club is owned by Charlie Giffen. He owed Joe Feldman $2,000, and the horse people say Joe collected it tonight. Well, that fits in, Jocko. Everybody in town's after that dough. They'll have to look some more. Hmm? I'm out on Arguello Boulevard.
Boulevard. Homicide just fished Joe Feldman out of the gutter. If Homicide finished second, he was a lucky guy. He didn't have the dough on him? No. Well, he stashed it somewhere. Then he left it with a woman. Yeah? Because he's got a woman's compact in his pocket, you uh, better hit the sister's place. How do we know he got it there? A woman's compact? If he didn't get it there, Alcatraz is getting too social. <laughs> Well, the minute Jocko hung up, things began to fall into place. But I knew the last piece was going to pinch somebody hard. If the Feldman blood was going to turn bad, Father Leahy was a good man to send in, so I called him. He was out, but I left word for him to get out to Norma Feldman's apartment. Norma and I left, and on the way, we picked up Hellman. When we got out to her place and started up the stairs, we could hear people moving above. There was no point in trying to keep quiet, because Hellman was creeping up the stairs like a stallion with a broken leg. Yeah, if you got a bomb, touch it off too, huh? Well, open it, Hellman. Hello, Novak. Did you find the dough, Giffen? You mean my stolen dough? Yeah, come on, eh? No, you and Ann better wait. This is Hellman from Homicide. We're leaving. You better move, Novak. Not until you settle a murder rap. Can you pay it off that fast? I can do it on the way to the door. Oh, wait a minute. Point the gun at Hellman. He's official. I can tag you both, so move away. You too, Norma. Ann and I are leaving. Look, Giffen. Homicide gobbles up nightclub big shots like you. You're nothing to me, copper. Move away. You got the hammer. Use it and come on through. All right, I will, copper. Hey. Yeah, hey, you need a refill, Giffen. That's right, darling. Hand him your gun. Ann. Ann, you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have taken him out. All right, so they fell out. You better take him for murder, Hellman. You little bum. That leaves you all the money. I can spend it, darling. Well, you better do it fast, then. Grab him, Hellman. Yeah, yeah I got him. Oh, you can fuck him for both murders. My Greeley and my brother. I'll testify and I'll ride there in a cab on your dough, Giffen. Yeah. Are you going to pose or take me, Hellman? If you're anxious. Sorry about you, Norma. You get nothing out of this, but that's better than I got. Goodbye, Ann. Lots of luck. Thank you, darling. You know what kind. I hope you're rot. Come on, Hellman. I'm ashamed of you, Anne. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm ashamed of you, Anne. What you did to Joe, I'm ashamed of you. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm sick, you know that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. Poor Joe was trying to help you and you got greedy. He was trying to help you. That's the only reason he came out. You let this happen. I told you I didn't know how it was going to end. I thought they'd get him and take him back again. There's no good in you, Ann. They couldn't find good in you anywhere. You let that happen to Joe. You stood by and watched him walk into something like that. All right, I stood by. What can we do about it now except weep, and that won't help him. But hating you will. That'll help Joe a little. I'm here at least to hate you for the short time left. Please, Norma. Giffen told you to spend it fast. Well, you better. You better spend it fast. Ask him at the hospital if that isn't so. What do you mean? Ask him out there what you've got. They told him. You ask him what you've got. Ask him what's tearing you to pieces. Ask him, they'll tell you. They'll tell you you've got cancer. Norma, please. They'll tell you cancer. Ask him, they'll tell you you're full of it. Now spend your money. Spend your money and see that it lasts as long as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, girls. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Novak. Well, did you miss much, Father? No. Feldman luck is running kind of bad tonight. It does for some people, I guess. All they get is unhappiness. They wear it the same way you'd wear a sports coat, only they never seem to get a new one. I'm sorry about tonight, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it's not a smoother world. Yeah. But if it were, you'd be out of a job, Father. See you later. If you get a bad first break, you never run the table. That's what happened to Joe Feldman. Charlie Giffen owed him dough and wouldn't pay up. 
But Joe didn't care until Norma showed up and told him how sick Ann was, so he decided to collect from Giffen and divide the dough between the girls. Father Leahy couldn't stop him. All he could do was try and make it work out. Joe was going to get the dough and meet the girls in that hotel room, but he changed his timetable and sent Mike Greeley up to tell the girls. Giffen showed up there and figured that Mike had tumbled to a double cross, so he killed him. Ann engineered the double cross, but she didn't mean to go that far. She wanted all the dough and tipped off Giffen. He was supposed to turn the dough over to her and then have the police pick up Joe, but Joe got there early. He took the dough away from Giffen and shot the copper on the way out. Giffen followed Joe and killed him out on Arguello, but the dough was gone. He finally tumbled to Norma's place, and that's how her apartment filled up so fast. Well, Hellman asked only one question. What did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Leahy offered me 50 bucks, but I didn't want it. Jocko was with me, and he offered to give it to charity. I guess he did, because where Jocko spent it, the drinks aren't worth money. Pat Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Welcome back. As usual, a lot uh, that I like about this uh, episode, uh, some of the more memorable uh, similes in a series known for them, and just some of the dialogue in this. I, I love the whole idea, you know, the statement, your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. I always thought that would be an interesting t-shirt, but I think that's probably a little bit esoteric for uh, most people. Because my idea would be you just have, uh, you know, moose going through a revolving door and a policeman standing around looking puzzled and no explanation or attribution. And some beautifully poetic ones uh, about Father Leahy. I like the idea of him, you know, wrapping the night around him. So, uh, some good stuff in here. And I, I really appreciated the music this time around. Uh, partly, I think the sound quality is a little better than when we first uh, played the series. And I think better than when we played the second. And I think there is just a nice bit of work that's being done on the actual score of the episode, particularly when we get into so many programs, you know, in the late 40s, early 50s, that just continue to rely on a music library. There really were some, you know, nice uh, musical cues worked into Pat Novak for hire. All right, well, uh, listener comments and feedback now. Of Candy Matson, Darby writes, this is one of my favorite radio shows. Well, I gl- I'm glad you uh, liked uh, Candy Matson, and I hope you enjoyed our uh, podcast of that uh, episode number 14 in our countdown. Then we have a comment uh, from David, who writes, you mentioned uh, th- that the dead letter office, when you first heard it, 
heard this, you agreed to wait a year before you put it on podcast, but you didn't say why you had to wait. So I was curious as to why. Can you elaborate? Uh, sure. Thanks so much for the question, David. Well, uh, in answer to your question, uh, there are a lot of ways that we get, you know, uh, and it may sound like an oxymoron, new uh, old time radio. Uh, one of that is through uh, purchasing groups uh, who will go and uh, purchase uh, old time radio programs, uh, taking you know money provided from uh, each member of the group in order to make you know fairly large purchases. And I'm part of one such group. And one of the rules is not to share the programs online within a year of them being distributed. And I think that's a reasonable rule so that the people who actually purchase the programs get to be the first ones to uh, enjoy them. And you always want to honor those sort of agreements because there's some great work being done to make sure that we, you know, are able to maintain and preserve as much of our radio uh, heritage as possible. And you never want to do anything that would interfere with that effort. So I always have to, you know, keep that in mind because I want to, that we don't do anything to interfere or undermine efforts being made to preserve and share old-time radio programs. So thanks so much uh, for the question. I appreciate it, uh, David. And uh, that will actually be all for today. I do want to thank our Patreon of the day. And I want to thank Mark. Mark has been one of our Patreon supporters since January of uh, 2016, and he's uh, currently supporting us at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Mark. And uh, that will be all for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Let George Do It. And then uh, next Monday, we continue our listener's choice countdown and reveal number 12 in the standard division. You'll want to find out who it is. Listen then. Uh, in the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.